Hello everyone, this is Ben, and in uh, this video, what we're going to talk about is the question of uh, human evolution and the book of Genesis. So, uh, you know, basically the question of uh, human origins and, you know, the relationship between Genesis and the Bible. This video is actually uh, made for some teenagers I know. And, uh, of course, anyone else will be able to watch it. But uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you, <clears throat> let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six views that uh, different, I guess, Bible scholars, for lack of a better term, that I can't think of a the correct word, um, theologians, it, theologians might not be the right word because we're talking about just direct interpretation of the Bible alone. Um, different points of view that they take. Um, and I'll give you the ones that I think are really the only major views that are really... that are seriously held by any serious amount of, you know, I guess, uh, Bible scholars today. Um... I'll give you, and what I'll do is I'll try to give you the views and then give you, uh, the, each view has its problems. Um, and, uh, I'll give you the, the difficulties of each view. In some cases, the difficulties of the view will be <clears throat> so bad that, uh, they won't be. It's just it's just a deal breaker for that view, and I just I, if I think that okay the difficulties of this view are just so bad that that uh, you just can't you just can't believe this view you know and, and, and retain you know your rational your status as a rational human you know what I mean like it's just you know if you know about this you're just you're just being blind in the face of the evidence but uh, the how do I put it. Some of these views have problems, um, some don't uh, have as big of a problem, and then uh, I think that pretty much covers it, so why don't we get right into it. <clears throat> the first view we're going to take a look at on this list is what I'll call uh, the metaphorical view. So what is the metaphorical view? Well, a metaphor is a basic linguistic thing that we use all day, every day. So, for example, we commonly uh, speak of, when we talk about sports, we use sports metaphors. So, like, uh, you know, people, people will say, let's say that you had a bad day, you know, at work, and you didn't get hurt. But somebody will tell you to walk it off. Well, walking it off is like something that you do for certain sports injuries. But sometimes people use that metaphorically to talk about other like other types of problems you may have in your life. Like maybe you made a bad grade on a test or maybe you had a long work day or somebody said something to you that made you mad and you just say, walk it off. You know, <laughs> that's a, that would be a metaphor. Um, some people take the metaphorical view... And uh, they say, all right, the origin of humans in Genesis, which essentially what we're, what we're focusing on when we talk about the origin of humans is Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. Because you do have humans created on the sixth day of creation, but you've also got the creation of Adam and Eve, and then they go on making descendants, and that actually happens in Genesis 2. So creation of humans is in the six days of creation in Genesis 1, and then you've got Adam and Eve there. They actually show up in the next chapter in Genesis 2. So uh, the, the metaphorical view, what they do is they say the, that, that whole thing, like Adam and Eve and all that, that didn't actually happen, and the Bible's not claiming to say that that happened. Rather, the Bible is speaking metaphorically it's using a metaphor like this is a lesson about god's relationship to people that has sort of a symbolic meaning so in the metaphorical view uh genesis 1 and 2 are more like 
Star Wars, they're good stories with like a good moral lesson, but they didn't really happen. Um, and God just inspired somebody to write. They're like fables. Um, now, the thing about metaphor, and the thing to keep in mind about metaphor is like you could you could go kind of crazy with the metaphor thing and say everything's a metaphor. Every you know you could just you could just make anything you want. And you say, oh, that was a metaphor. So I mean, obviously, we can't just say you know things are a metaphor when we feel like it, and then when we want something not to be a metaphor, then it's you know true. You know, that wouldn't, you know, <laughs> like, let's say that, uh, you know, somebody borrows $10 from you and then you want, you want him to pay you back next week. And he's like, oh, I just, you know, when I said I was going to pay you back, I meant it metaphorically. I'll, I'll pay you back by, you know, you know, uh, being a good friend or something. And it's like, well, you can be a big good friend. You want to, I mean it literally, I, I didn't mean it metaphorically. I meant literally you're going to give me $10. You know, I, I literally gave you $10, you know. So obviously, <laughs> there is this issue of like we do need some sort of method for, you know, just in life if we're going to exist and get along with people and communicate with people, we need to break down like what's a metaphor and what isn't. Well, a basic rule to keep in mind for metaphor is that uh, you should always assume literal language until you have a reason to go metaphor. So like. Literal language should be the d default assumption. And you say, well, why is that, Ben? And I'll, well, I'll explain why. Um, the, uh, let's, so let's, here's an example of a metaphor that's used in sports all the time. Uh, when some, let's say that you want a football game 50 to nothing, then uh, what that means is we would say that, like, you murdered the other team or you obliterated them or something, you killed them, okay? You obviously mean that metaphorically. You really, all you did is you, you scored way more points than them. You didn't. No one's, you know, no one's going to face a jury for, of their peers for murder on the on the football field. What you mean is like you scored way more points than them. Okay. Well, see, if we use the word murder, every if if. If it became the standard way that people use the language, you know, use the word murder in our English language, where nobody ever used the word murder to talk about actual, you know, killing of people like homicide, and they always use this metaphorical use, then the metaphorical meaning in that case would not be the metaphorical meaning. It, the literal meaning would just mean that you beat another, the other team by a lot of points. Okay, so. The literal meaning is the literal meaning because that's the default meaning that the word means, you know, normally. So, what this means is you assume literal until you have a reason to go metaphor, okay? So, that sets us up for, for a framework. And uh, when it comes to metaphor in the Bible specifically, what the Bible tends to do is give you a sort of... Uh, a dead giveaway that is that is using a metaphor in this particular case. So, so for example, um, one of the things that the Bible does is it gives you a like a blatant contradiction, like a like a really like in other words, the Bible will will contradict itself really, really, really intentionally. So that like it's so blatant that it's like this is not an accident. This is like an intentional contradiction. This the, the Bible contradicted itself on purpose here, and it makes it clear to us that like it's obviously a metaphor because there's no way someone did this by accident. This is on purpose. Like this is this is this is like screaming in your face. An example of this would be in First uh, Samuel. I think it's chapter eight. Uh, or is it 18? I, I'm struggling with the, to remember it. Or is it 15? Anyway, uh, it's the chapter where King Saul is facing the Amalekites. And uh, God basically tells King Saul to go kill all the Amalekites. It's a commandment from God. And God tells King King Saul to kill all the Amalekites down to the, the every woman and child and every animal, and even every baby, it says small children, and then it goes down to say even every infant of the Amalekites. So, this would be, 
full-blown genocide. So it appears that God commanded uh, King Saul to commit genocide. Well, the thing is, we know from just our knowledge of that culture and that time that when someone said they committed genocide on another, you know, in other words, genocide is when you kill all of the people of like a particular nation or a race. So like uh, if someone killed everyone in your hometown, then you would say that they committed genocide on your hometown. So, uh, you know, or if someone killed all of the English, all the English people in England, then you would say they committed genocide on England. Okay, well, if you committed, if, if you killed all the Amalekites, even down to the babies, then you committed genocide on the, you know, um, I don't know if anyone's ever actually successfully committed a genocide, but people have tried, and people have killed lots of people, but uh, the, the thing is, in, when King Saul lived, it was just really common for kings to brag about the genocide that they committed, like, all the time. And it was obvious that they were just using a metaphor. So it's kind of like if you say, oh, we beat them a hundred to nothing, you know, so we, we, we slaughtered them. Like, in other words, like, if you beat someone, back in those days, if you beat someone in a battle really, really bad, then you would, you would speak about it in these genocidal terms. That's like, I killed them. I killed them down to their women. I killed them down to all their donkeys. I killed all their small children. I killed all their babies. I, you know, I killed all the men. I killed their dogs and their cats. You know, it was just like a, it was a metaphor for how they spoke. And you say, well, Ben, how do you know that the Bible is using that metaphor? Well, the Bible makes a really blatant contradiction that helps us know in that case, because about 10 chapters later, King David, or actually David's not king yet at that point, is fighting battles with Amalekites, which is like, it's just ch 10 chapters later in the same book of the Bible. I, you know, I'm sure the people that like wrote the book, like, because it wasn't written by Samuel, it was probably written by Samuel's school, his, his students, basically, his followers. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure they, they knew that like that wasn't... Uh, you know, that was obviously a contradiction. So, like, it makes it clear to us that, like, it must be metaphorical. Okay, you say, well, all right, Ben, you've established some, you know, guidelines for how to determine if something's a metaphor or not. And I would say, when it comes to the question of human evolution, the issue is, you know, people want to say you've got to believe in evolution or you believe in the Bible. Um... And some people say, well, no, the, uh, the Bible is just, just a metaphor when it comes to human evolution. And you can still, you know, this, this whole creation of Adam and Eve, just a metaphor. And really, you can believe in evolution and, and the Bible metaphorically. I would say, no, you can't because there's just nothing, there's nothing in, in the text of the Bible that, that really justifies a metaphorical interpretation there. I haven't found it. Okay. And there's other stuff in Genesis where you've got it. You know, I'm not going to go into it for this video. We're like, there, there are things like it's one of those blatant intentional contradictions with others, with other important questions on human origins even, but not the, the question of like, how did humans originate? Like, you just don't have anything like that. Like, you're going to have to take it where Adam and Eve actually existed, were actual real people. Okay, so maybe that... That's our first view on the list. Let's move on to the next view. Um, the next view is what everyone calls YEC, or what's called Young Earth Creationism. Now, Young Earth Creationism uh, is essentially the view that God created the world in six 24-hour days 6,000 years ago. And then... God directly created the birds. God directly created the sea creatures. God directly created the land um, by an, a supernatural act of God for all of those things. Uh, God directly created Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve, uh, they, all humans on this planet are descendants of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve are the original pair of, of the two turtle doves of people. And uh, everyone else is their children on this whole planet. Uh, 
Uh, and then uh, there was a global flood that flooded the entire globe, and where even that this I'm just giving you the standard YEC view, Young Earth Creationism view. The entire globe was underwater. Uh, even Mount Everest was underwater in the days of Noah, which they say happened. That global flood happened in 2400 BC. Um, so just a hundred years before Sargon of Akkad, you know, conquered Mesopotamia, and uh, two hundred years after the Egyptians built uh, the pyramids at Giza, uh, the entire globe was flooded. Um, they say dinosaurs, you know, survived the flood and coexisted with humans uh, because again, there's no like millions and billions of years of where dinosaurs could have gone extinct sixty-five million years ago. There's none of that. The Earth is the universe, the cosmos, everything is 6,000 years old in the YC view. And uh, they say that story, dinosaurs existed all the way up until 500 years ago as dragons. We called them dragons back then. Um, so I'm just kind of trying to give you the basic rundown over what the YEC view has. And of course, they don't believe that uh, humans evolved um at all so they in fact they argue that there's a there's a number of skeletons that have been found um of like you know like for example lucy which is an australopithecus that's like dated to four million years ago that has the hip bones that Clearly, this, this creature walked upright just like a person and wasn't a tree dweller, but had the brain size of a chimpanzee. So, uh, you know, they, they, you know, so these are called hominids. These, like, we've had, we've got, we found lots of skeletons of, of sort of pseudo people, you know, there's somewhere between an ape and a human. And they say that, like, well, we, you know, all of those bones could fit in the back of a pickup truck. And, uh, that's true, I think. And they, you know, of course, it's not like just two skeletons or five skeletons. It, 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 it's small pieces. It's You might find one jawbone or one skull. You know, you could fit a lot of skulls in the back of a pickup truck. And they're found all over the world. Um, but anyway, uh, they, you know, they say all of those, you know, they, they even go into conspiracy theory territory that, like, you know, this is just, you know, scientists who want to destroy the credibility of the Bible. Okay, so what are the, what is the downside to the young earth creationism view? Well, you could talk about a lot of things with it because it's a bigger view than just human, human origins. But for this video, all we want to talk about is the question of human origins or like human evolution. Um, the biggest downside for the YEC view of uh, human evolution or, or what they take, you know, what I'll call the original pair, that there's a there's an original pair of Adam and Eve and uh, they didn't have parents. They were specially created by God and then they had children and, and everyone is their child. Uh, what's probably the biggest problem for their view is uh, something called the incest problem. So the incest problem is just the, the whole issue of, you know, if you were to you know, like marry your mom or marry your dad and have kids with them, or marry your brother or sister, uh, that would be something that's called incest. Okay. Um, you can't legally do that, to my knowledge, um, at least in America. Uh, you can marry second cousins. Um, first cousins, I think some states allow it and some states don't. Um, but uh, I don't know the specific laws on that. You might want to look that up if you're really interested. But uh, essentially, there's an incest problem. One, it's immoral. Um, it, it, it's, you can the Bible actually says that it's immoral, uh, you know, not in Genesis, but later on the Bible talks about it being immoral. 
Now, the, the question of, like, well, maybe it's immoral. Well, the Bible has sort of a progressive teaching of right and wrong. So, you know, so Adam and Eve, you know, are brought into the world. They don't, you know, and, and says they're naked and they, and they don't realize that, like, they should have some clothes on. They just don't know any better. Just like little children, you know, run around naked, little babies, and they don't know, you know, and you don't hold it against them. They have no idea. But as they get older, they need to learn right from wrong, good from evil. You know, they learn not to do bad things and to do good things. And So I, I wouldn't see that as a problem necessarily. The problem is is that incest is not, it's not just immoral. It, uh, it's... It has a biological problem. So children will be born with birth defects. And it it could cause serious problems. So in other words, you've got Adam and Eve there. And what are they going to do? Well, they're going to have a lot of kids, hopefully. Lots and lots of children. You know, let's say that Eve has a hundred children, you know, which would be an incredible amount of children. And it's like, it doesn't really matter what kind of number... You can, you know, you can throw on it. You can say Eve lived 900 years and, you know, I guess if she had a child every year, then she'd have 900 children or something like that. Because it says in there that Adam lived 930 years, which is a whole other question. But like, uh, you know, say she had a thousand kids. What do those kids do to, you know, are they all going to die out? Well, no, they're going to have to marry each other. So it's all, it's all going to be brother and sister incest to produce the you know the next generation the third generation you know, Adam and Eve first then their children then where does the next generation come from massive levels of incest and you still got massive levels of incest because it then everyone's first cousins you know but they're not just first cousins they're first cousins of incestuous marriages so I don't even know if that counts as first cousins you know you're not bringing in any outside outside DNA from outside of the Adam and Eve direct family unit and you're supposed to populate the planet this way so this is a problem because like these kids would be there would be birth defects galore okay um it's it raises questions about how humanity could have even survived this so You know, I want to be fair to the YEC view here. What could what could they do to solve this problem? Well, they would have to suggest that God performed a miracle to bypass this biological problem. You know, like, you know, God parted the Red Sea and allowed the Israelites to walk through on dry land. And, you know, even though the Egyptian arm no, under normal conditions, normal the normal natural way of things is they can't cross that sea without a boat. And uh, they were stuck, and they were pinned between the sea and the army, and the army would have got them right there. Um, But then God performs a miracle, parts the Red Sea, the Israelites cross the Red Sea on dry land, and uh, and then, to top it all off, God performs another miracle and causes the Red Sea to go back to normal and drowns the Egyptian army. And it's this big military defeat by a miracle of God, you know, and the Israelites... Under normal natural methods, they would have been easily defeated by the Egyptian army. This was a uh, these these were they were all refugee slaves, okay. Although not all of them, um, that's a whole other question. But like there were other people living in Egypt, and uh, that weren't from Egypt, that were from the land of Canaan, and they left with uh, the Israelites, and the, and those other people weren't necessarily. The Bible doesn't tell us that they were slaves. But anyway, uh, so the point is, with the YEC view, you could fix it by saying, like, okay, uh, God performed a miracle here and, and, you know, solved the incest problem. Well, the problem with that solution is that that's what's called eisegesis. That's, that, in other words, that's, saying, that's coming to the Bible with something you need it to say. And then trying to like find it in there, but you're it's not the correct uh, form of interpretation is what's called exegesis, which means your view on the Bible comes from the Bible instead of 
being forced into the Bible. So, like, where is this miracle of God that, you know, where God performs this miracle? You know, you're just assu- you're just assuming that, like, God performed this miracle, and you're saying, oh, you know, right here between verse 6 and verse 7, there's an implied verse that I'm going to put in there. God performed a miracle on Adam and Eve and gave them extra super fertility so that they couldn't have incest problem. Like, you're just assert- inserting that in there. So, when it comes to human origins, that's really the main problem with Adam and Eve. Um, what you could do if you are a defender of the YEC view is you could go back to Genesis 1 where it says God tells Adam and Eve, it says that he blessed them and told them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So, like, you could say, well, that was it. You know, that is the miracle that we're looking for. The problem, this is Genesis uh, 128. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Well, the problem is, is like, there's no reason to take this necessarily as God performing this miracle. You just kind of need this miracle and you're going and looking for it. And hoping that, you know, you're kind of assuming it. Because, like, you could take Genesis 1.28 another way. And it would make perfect sense. Um, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, and I'll keep reading it. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the, in the sky and over living cre- every living creature that moves on the ground. And God's God's not blessing them with, like, super baby-making abilities. God's blessing them with authority to take over the world. He's giving he's he's giving them authority over this planet. He's giving humans authority over this planet. So given that that view really, you know, makes more sense, um but at, at the very least like there's no reason to take the other view. So anyway, that's the main problem with the young earth creationism view, okay? Let's move on. Uh, next view we're going to take a look at. Another thing about young earth creationism, though, is that sometimes they, they tend to be poo-poo heads about anyone who disagrees with them. So, like, they, they tend to say that, like, their view is obviously what the Bible says, and anyone who doesn't agree with them just doesn't believe the Bible. It's a, and they have a, they, they, that is one, if you, if you watch how they debate people who disagree with them, you, it will be the fastest thing to make you drop, you know, any belief you had or any credibility you gave to young earth creationism, because the people who defend it, they don't seem to have like they send, they tend to just say that everyone who disagrees with them is a bad person. They 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 go for that like all the time. Um, so anyway, uh, their view was the dominant view among Christians, I think from like around 500 AD up until like the 1800s. But it was not the dominant view for most of Christian history. Um, For most of Christian history, uh, young earth, people thought that the, the days of creation in Genesis 1 were a metaphor and that the, all of them happened instantaneously. (laughs) Um, that was the dominant view, but they the, the days were a metaphor because they thought there's no way God would take any amount of time to create the world. That was the dominant view up until around, you know, more modern times. Um, we won't go into that because, uh, well, maybe we should say a little something about it. Um, so even as far back as 400 A.D., uh, uh, Saint Augustine or Saint Augustine, uh, you depending on you know which name there's people call it, he goes by both names these days um he said the days of creation in genesis 1 could have been long ages or epics or eons or they could have been 24 hour days well he argues well actually he argues that they couldn't have been 24 hour days at least in the first 3 and then he thinks that like he he thinks they still could have been long ages or epics or eons or they could have been instantaneous, and then he decides that they were instantaneous, and that the whole thing was a a, a metaphor. He he takes a metaphorical view of the days of creation in Genesis one, and part of it is 
why does he take that view? Well, it's not a biblically driven view for Augustine. It was a theologically driven view. He just couldn't wrap his mind around the idea that God would take a long time to do anything. Anything God does happens instantaneously, you know. So that was the view. Um, and the the argument in the Middle Ages was like, world, are the last three days of the six literal 24-hour days, or are they all metaphor for, like, a creation in an instant? Um, which is beside the point, but sometimes the YEC, you know, the, y, the Young Earth Creationism crowd, they tend to say, well, you know, nobody, nobody uh, thought that the Earth was older than 6,000 years, you know, until modern science and modern times, and people are trying to twist the Bible to make it fit with modern science, and it's like, well, that's not entirely accurate. Augustine said in 400 AD that the days of creation could have been long ages, but he, he chose a metaphorical view, not for biblical reasons, but for like philosophical theology reasons. Um, and the thing is, his thought, he was the architect of the thought of Christians of the Middle Ages. Like, he, him and Thomas Aquinas, who lived in the middle of the Middle Ages, they those guys just basically defined what Christians thought for, like, basically most of Christian history. So, uh, it's not true. I mean, he, you know, it's not true, that, like, no one ever said that before modern times. Christians suggested that idea, and it was on the table as a possibility, going far back as 400 A.D., so anyway, we're still, now we're done talking about the YEC view. The next view we're going to talk about is what's called, what I'll call T, well, people call it TE. Um, it's called the, theological evolution. So, so how does theological evolution work? Um, well, there's a bunch of stuff in theological evolution. We can't go into all of it. We're going to talk just about human origins. Under the theological evolution view, uh, <coughs> Adam... And Eve, well, the, under the, under the TE view, humans just evolve on this planet, and God just sits back and waits until a certain like animal, uh, a certain animal develops uh, higher levels of mental abilities. And once, once a certain species of animals finally develops higher level of mental abilities, God picks one of them and breathes a living soul into that one. And that one, so like it happened, it happened with like apes. Apes eventually evolved into like rational beings. And so then God said, okay, I will breathe a living soul into one of them. So like, what that's talking about is in Genesis chapter 2, um, it says, The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and uh, breathed into his, breath, his nostrils the breath of life. Now, I have to be careful here because I know people that hold the TE view and like the, their version of the TE view makes the TE view look bad and I don't want to make it look worse than it has to be. Um, so I'll give it to you in the, I guess the, the more correct, you know, the actual, you know, so the, you know, if you run into somebody that holds the view, they may hold like a weirdo version of the view, but like, uh, Essentially, I guess we'll get right to the... What is the problem with the TE view? <laughs> um, primary problem with the TE view on human origins is like, how do you get Adam existing? And it says in Genesis 2 that that there was no suitable like wife, basically, for Adam. No suitable mate. No suitable female partner for Adam. With evolution, that would never happen. Evolution doesn't have, uh, like, you don't you don't have like a bunch of apes, you know, 
living in in an ape colony somewhere in Africa, and then uh, ape mama and daddy have a baby, and just a human being pops out. Like evolution is like a slow process that takes millions of years, and little changes over time. If the change is beneficial, then in later generations, that change will become more and more dominant until eventually you have uh, a new species. You know, or you might split into two separate species. Or, you know, something like that. So, uh, evolution in that case, like, if Adam existed, there would, of course, be someone for Adam to... uh, a wife for Adam, you know, so that's, that's kind of a problem for the TE view, um, there are ways around it, but it kind of jumps into other views, so like, I mean, the TE view is kind of broad, you could, you could take it other ways, and we'll we'll take a look at like, sort of alternate versions of the TE view that sort of take it other ways. But I, I think an important thing, that, that, that's kind of a problem. It's like, how did you have a man without a woman? Uh, in evolution, that just never happens, you know, because it's just a, you have to have a whole bunch of members of the species slowly evolving over millions of years. You would never have just a, you know, a, in, you would never have somebody give birth to someone and, there would, and then there would be no female. Like, you would have to, you know, for evolution to work, you have to always have continual, you know, reproduction over long periods of time. Um, an important thing to understand about the TE view is something called the do- doctrine of secondary causation, which is actually something that Christians, theologians, it's, it's more of a philosophical theology thing <laughs> that Christians happened upon in the Middle Ages. So, uh, it's not really biblically driven, but good logical reasoning about God or theology is a, is a good thing because if you know if you can know that like if the Bible tells you that like that a about God, this fact about God, and then that fact about God, you can deduce well then this other fact about God would have to be true logically if the other two are true. So. You know, there's 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 a lot that can be done with philosophical reasoning. So, like, if the Bible tells you that you know God has a plan, uh, God loves you. Let's say God loves you, and God has a and, and God created the world. Then you could say God created you out of love. God has you know God has a a, a plan. Uh, you know, or if you can just say God created the world and God is all-knowing, then you can philosophically deduce then God must have a plan for the world because why would God, you know, create the world and have no plan for it? Um, there's a bunch of things, you know, you could, you could really dig into it, but the particular one we're talking about right now is something called secondary causation, and this is really important for some of the later views we're going to talk about. So, to understand secondary causation, you have to you have to understand primary causation. So primary causation would be like <clears throat> if you were to if there were a cup on the table and you were to push the cup off the table and then the water or the Kool Aid or whatever would fall over all over the floor. That would be primary causation. You directly caused it. Secondary causation would be like you can think of it like dominoes. Like if you set up a bunch of dominoes and then you push, you only push the domino over here, and then maybe you made a domino chain a mile long, five thousand two hundred eighty feet long, and then the domino on the end fell down, and you would say, "What caused the domino on the end to fall down? Did Ben knock it down? Well, I didn't touch the domino, so I didn't knock it down. Well, not really. I didn't primarily cause it, but I did secondarily cause it. Okay. So the issue becomes like, all right." In our universe, you know, of physical matter, you have, you know, chemical reactions happening and rocks bump into other rocks and ex- volcanoes explode and asteroids move around and the earth rotates and the moon causes the tides and, 
and a mountain pops out of the ground and then it snows on the mountain, you know, and there's a river and there's all sorts of natural processes that happen. And the thing is, <coughs> in a grand sense, God could have caused something to happen like long ago that then, you know, causes a later miracle that appears to be just a natural event. So like, so for example, with the parting of the Red Sea, what the book of Exodus says when the Israelites crossed the Red Sea is that the Lord God caused a wind to come. A wind to come and, and that, that, that a wind blew in part of the Red Sea. Okay, well what creates wind? Well normally wind is created by differences between hot and cold air. Well, what could create hot air? I don't know, a, a long summer or basically the sun or maybe a volcano went off somewhere, something heated up some air, maybe there was an abundance of greenhouse gas, you know, um, something on the earth. Well, what caused that to happen? What caused, you know, what caused, you say, we had a long summer that year? What well, could be something with the rotation of the earth that just has a slight wobble to it every once in a while? cause it to be hot in a certain place on the planet and then cold in another place on the planet and then you know boom God could have planned from the time he created the earth for the Israelites to one day long later be crossing the Red Sea and created the earth just in such a way so that like he knew that like this is gonna you know at, at this certain point in the future, this will cause this to happen. And everything that happened naturally on the earth could be like a set of dominoes that eventually cause the Red Sea to part at just the right time. So you could say, well, that sounds really complicated. How could God figure all that out? Well, it's like, well only God could figure all that out. But in that sense, like God could control everything that happens just from the the creation of the world and sort of set it all up where it all sort of operates like a big machine. So under the TE view, under the theological evolution view, evolution would be something that happens that, but God is in control of it. So there's like no, there's no need to say that it's just this wild, undirected thing. God could, you know, According to the principle of secondary causation, God could, God could control it and, and could have always planned and always known exactly and, and designed where it would go, where it would end up, and it would end up with you know Adam and Eve and that sort of thing, and God always knew that. So uh, it wouldn't necessarily be... This is the key idea to understand. Are we talking about God coming in and miraculously creating birds... And miraculously creating, you know, rats, and miraculously creating all the all the cows. Or are we talking about a long process of evolution, where God set the whole thing in motion like a big system of dominoes, and God knew exactly where it was going to wind up? And so in Genesis one, when it says, "And the Lord God said, Let the land produce, you know, livestock according to their kinds." Well, that's exactly what evolution is. The earth eventually produced livestock according to their various kinds. You know, um, so, uh, I mean, when I say that's exactly what evolution is, evolution is a lot more complicated than that, but there's not a real big problem there. The problem you run into with evolution is like it, you know, the, the millions and billions of years question and the, and the creation days in Genesis. So you got to take a look at that question, which we're not doing in this video. And you've got human origin questions, especially you know, like we said, with the TE view, you're going to run into a problem of uh, a man without a woman. That, that doesn't make sense. Okay, so uh, moving on, let's talk about. I don't know if you would call this these other views alternate versions of the TE view. I'm not sure how to classify these, but we'll just take a look at the next one. We're going to take a look at is what's called the co-atomite view, which technically sometimes is called a pre-atomite view, but that can be confusing because there's another view called the pre-atomite view. So we're just going to use the term co-atomite view for this. The co-atomite view uh, essentially says 
Genesis 1, if you were to just read Genesis 1 and you were to leave Genesis 2 out of it, you would never, from reading Genesis 1, you would never think that, like, God created two, a boy bird and a girl bird, and then they they had lots of babies, and those babies made all the birds, you know, became, you know, or all the, all the different birds. Like, uh, you would never think that. And the same thing with humans, like, Genesis 1 doesn't talk about one human and, and one, you know, one man and one woman. It just says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over, you know. So God created mankind in the image of God. He created them, male and female, He created them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. So, like, this isn't an origin of just an original pair. This is just an origin of a group. Okay, so under the co-Adamite view, what the co-Adamite view says is that Genesis 1 is talking about God's creating humanity. And then Genesis 2 is talking about Adam and Eve creation that's they're not in other words under the co-adamite view god created people then god created two special people who had special job adam and eve and adam and eve are not the ancestors of all humans rather they are two really important people that god created with a very important job and then they blew it and uh they were given like uh, a lot of authority you know so, uh, under the co-Adamite view, like, God created humans, but humans were primitive and didn't, uh, didn't really know much about God. And all they, all they knew was that, you know, it, there's, a, there's a big distinction between the creation of humans in Genesis 1 and the creation of all the animals. Because it says, and God said, let the water team with living creatures and let birds fly. You know, God says these things. And then it happens, and it was so. <coughs> God says, let this happen, and it was so. God says, let this happen, and it was so. But then it says, God said, let's make mankind in our image. God created mankind. And then verse 28 has something that's different from all the animals. God actually speaks to the humans, which doesn't happen with any of the animals. God said, God blessed them and said to them. He didn't just say it. He said it to the humans. So the humans are on a some sort of different level. That's that's the basic difference between humans and animals. Animals don't talk. You know, they, they have incre when they do communicate, it's incredibly limited compared to humans. Okay, so uh, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So God essentially creates man under the co-adamite view god creates mankind as a group and it could be on under a theological evolution version of it they could just have evolved because under secondary causation it would still be god doing it because really everything that happens is under the command of god um and under the plan of god you know and that kind of thing um so god blessed them and said to them be fruitful and increase in number fill the earth and subdue it so the thing is, in Genesis 1.27, it says, said God created mankind in his own image. Um, from what I've read of biblical scholars, when it says in right there, it means in as in like, if you were to, it, it doesn't mean like in as in the, you know, the I am in the chair or my drink is in the cup. I'm thirsty. So the water is in the cup. Ugh. No, uh, it means in as if I would say I am in landscaping or somebody would say I'm in education as in like a job. So God created mankind in his own image. So you're in the image of God as a job. Your job is to be in God's image. In other words, you are God's representative. Okay, yours to represent God. You're here under God, under God's authority as God's representative. Okay. So humans are created in God's image in this sense, and then we've got God bless them and said to them, "Be fruitful and multiply." So, like, you, one of the basic things of having a job is is a to do list. Like, you can't really 
have it work for someone unless that somebody tells you stuff to do. So uh, those things to do become commands. So this is like the first command. God commands humans to fill the planet and control it and manage it. And humans did, you know, do that according to what the scientists tell us. Like he, humans are one of the d distinctive things about humans is the diverse the diversity of environments in which humans can inhabit. We there's still you know we still can't you know live on the bottom of the sea, but maybe one day. But like uh, humans live in a variety of environments, and we did this. We've always been we've been doing this for a long time, like since the Stone Age. You know, people have been living. People made their way everywhere on this planet. They've you know they found their way to the teeny tiniest islands out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, you know, and lived there and farm it, and fish, and like, and, and humans pretty much dominate the world. And that's all he's saying is fill the planet and dominate the world. Okay, well, humans did that. Okay, but then along comes Adam and Eve, who are also made in God's image, but they clearly have a, a, like a, a much more connected relationship with God. It says that God planted a garden in the land of Eden. The garden is not Eden, it's in the land of Eden. Well, the thing to understand there is that in the ancient world, a garden and a temple were the same thing. So, a, all well, maybe I should say it this way. All temples were also gardens, were full of plants and animals. That's the way you made a temple in the ancient world. It was like a very gardeny thing, okay? In addition to that, uh... A garden that was planted by a divine being, by a god, or in this case Yahweh, was definitely a temple. Okay, and then Adam and Eve are placed in the garden, which would mean that they're, they are the priests that live in the temple. So Adam and Eve would have been God's high priests. And they communicate directly with the god who has a regular presence in the temple with them, which is normal for what temples were. So, and they have other commands from God. God places a sacred tree in the middle of the garden that they're not allowed to eat from. It's not an evil tree. It's not a bad tree. What you would put in the middle of your temple would be like the most sacred tree. So anyway, uh, under the co-Adamite view, Adam and Eve are God's high priests and priestess. And God has created humanity with like some simple commands, but now God has created Adam and Eve, and their job is to have children, and through their children, convert the world to be sort of fit to be in God's presence. Make the world more fit to be in God's presence. Um, so... Uh, in other words, they are fit to be in God's temple, but the rest of the world is not fit to be in God's temple. And they basically, the idea is, to make, they, their job is to make the whole world like the Garden of Eden. You know, um, This idea of Adam and Eve as like the high priest and high priestess, pretty much all the biblical scholars accept it. They're like, yeah, that's definitely the case here. So that's not really controversial. The, the, the issue... What's unique about the Adamite view is not that Adam and Eve are a high priest and high priestess. The, what, what's unique about the co-Adamite view is that there were already humans that Adam and Eve would serve as high priests and high priestess too. And Adam and Eve wouldn't just always be in the garden. It's sacred space. Okay. So anyway, uh, uh, under the co the, the main problem with the co-Adamite view is like, well, there's a few problems. Um, one is like, okay, well, how does original sin work if, uh, you know, all, in other words, under this view, all the people on the planet are not necessarily Adam and Eve's descendants. You know, some people might not be their descendants at all. So, like, you know, there's this Christian doctrine, a long-standing Christian doctrine, that like Adam's sin of eating the fruit in the garden created was like an original sin, and then we've all inherited this sort of tendency to sin, and it's all Adam's fault. Well, 
that particular view isn't really explicitly said in the Bible. What the Bible says is that Adam, we are all sinners, and Adam, like, you know, led us in that. But it doesn't say that, like, it, it passed from parent to child genetically like that. That's not actually in the Bible. That is a doctrine that actually, here he comes back again, Augustine created. The Christian Augustine created around 400 A.D. So you could look at the, uh, the doctrine of original sin and you could take it another way that Adam was someone with authority to lead us to God, but when Adam obeyed Satan or the serpent, then Adam essentially let the wolf off the leash. And uh, Adam, was a, Adam had authority from God to lead the world to God, and then Adam became sort of the wrong kind of leader. Uh, and so that Jesus, when Jesus comes, is like the, the second Adam. Adam as he should have been, you know. Adam, the proper Adam that's going to lead the world to Jesus. But the world would be in a state of sin because uh, the devil led everyone on this planet to sin. But Adam's, Adam's the one who had authority from God to lead the world and then what Adam does is he says I'm going to obey the serpent well now the serpent's Adam's boss so now the serpent has authority to go around the world and corrupt humanity you know so like imagine people who knew very little about God whose relationship with God was incredibly simplistic and then their knowledge of God becomes like incredibly corrupted. Okay. So the problem, I guess the main problem with this view is that it's not that old and it has like all sorts of like questions that are still dangling. Like, okay, well, so there would have been sin before Adam's sin maybe? Yeah, possibly, but maybe God doesn't hold it against people or like, you know, how does salvation work before Adam or sin or heaven or hell? Like all that stuff, you know, there's all kinds of questions that like need to be answered. And what I'm going to say is like, we just still need to look into it, but there's a lot there to work with. And so I, I would say with, that's what I would say with the co-Adamite view. Um, let's see, what else we have here? So, we are an hour in now. We've got, the next view we need to take a look at is, uh, the, the progressive creation view. The progressive creation view, um, if you've ever heard of Hugh Ross or Reasons to Believe Ministries, this is their view. So progressive creation is, they take the days in Genesis 1, the days of creation in Genesis 1, as like long ages or epics or eons, which uh, a case, a powerful case can be made that that should be done. Um, because, uh, well, for one thing, the pro one of the problems is that in that ancient language, the word that is translated day is the Hebrew word yom. And so the thing is, that word can, it can mean literal 24-hour day, but it can also mean, uh, if you were to say age, epic, or eon, in that language, yom would be the only word in your entire language to say that. It's also the only word for 24-hour day. It's also the only word for, like, the time from the sun, you know, half the day, when you know, the daytime part of the day. So, like... If Moses wanted to say age, epic, or eon, when he picked the word yom, he, he literally picked the only word in his entire language to say that. So it, it is literal. You could translate the, that God created the world in, in six ages. Now, the problem with that is that it says there was evening and there was morning day one. There was evening and there was morning day two. And... Uh, that part seems like, well, evening and morning seem very, uh, it seems like it's making it clear, it's like telling you how to take it, you know. 
which it, it does seem like it's telling you how to take it. Like, this is a, a you know, a literal 24-hour day. But then you have the issue that Augustine noticed in 400 AD, that on the fourth day, the sun and the moon are established to mark the passage of evening and morning. So then you, you have this problem of, like, what kind of evening and morning were we talking about before there was a sun and the moon? Augustine's point, what he says is, he says, that's kind of an unimaginable day, you know. It, you know, you're trying to imagine, you know, so like you would have to say like, well, you know, God was just making light happen somehow some other way before the sun and the moon and there was a day and a night cycle and then God created the sun and the moon to like, mark the passage of day and night well the problem with that view is like you've you've created some sort of hypothetical other light source that is very like it's not talked about in the bible you're just kind of creating it out on your own um the other problem is like well the seventh day is the last day where God rests from creating, and then there's no, and there was evening and there was morning the seventh day. That never happens. And the issue is, like, well, God's still resting from creating the world. You know, God's still resting from creating the world. And it says God rested on the seventh day. So the seventh day must be a long age. It's, it's ever since creation. It was a very long age. So, like, you know... Uh, the YEC people, what they say is like, well, the seventh day was like just the first day that God started resting, but God's also resting on day eight, day nine, day ten. The problem with that is that God, it says God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested. And so it doesn't really make sense to say God blessed the beginning of his rest, his holy rest. He didn't just bless the beginning, the first day of his rest, he blessed his rest. And since it's on the seventh day that he rests, you know, that, that, that essentially it just doesn't work. So the seventh day has to be an age. So if the seventh day is an age, then you've got one of those blatant contradictions we were talking about. Um, so anyway, uh, I didn't mean to talk about that, but there we went. Uh, the progressive creation view, that's their thing. I guess that's why we had to talk about it. That's their thing, is that, like, it was seven days of creation. Um, or six days of creation, but those days were long ages. Other than that, the progressive creation view, what they do is they think that God actually came in, and not secondary causation, primary causation, created, like, the birds, created the plants, directly, as a direct miracle, enter, like, entered into the natural order of things on this planet. And so, you know, God let the earth run for like, you know, a few billion years and then came in and created plants directly as like a miracle. Okay. And what these, under the progressive creation view, each of these days represent God's creative like eons. And uh, things are rolling along sort of naturally, but then God comes in and gives it sort of a boost every so often. And uh, there's some evidence for this scientifically because every so often evolution gets sort of a kickstart. And uh, I don't know how good of an evidence that is. You would need to talk to someone that's like more trained than me. But that is something uh, that deserves attention at least. Because, you know, that's the that's one of the arguments from the progressive creation view is like, okay, you've got this long evolutionary history, but it seems like it sort of, ha it sort of breaks down into these sort of ages or epochs or eons. And those ages and epochs and eons sure do fit real well with the six days of creation in Genesis. So <clears throat> they're suggesting that God came in and sort of performed a miracle every so often. And so they have what's called, that's what's called special creation versus like secondary causation kind of thing. So uh, that's essentially the progressive creation view. 
Um, when it comes to human origins, the problem with the progressive creation view is you have, uh, there's some good genetic evidence that humans are really descended from apes. Like we've got 98% uh, chimpanzee DNA. Um, so that needs to be taken into account. Uh, and then I guess the real prop, the real, you know, that's not really a biblical problem. The biblical problem with the, with the progressive creation view is like, uh, it's sort of, it's not necessarily required by the text, you know, um, that you don't have to like, you know, the question is like, are each one of these days of creation really a shift where God, you know, caused a miracle every time? And then when it comes to the creation of humans, you know, I don't know. I think there's different versions of the progressive creation view. But, uh, so I'm sitting here thinking like, okay, well, there's, there's this problem with that version. But if they had to take another version, then they don't have that problem. Then they take another problem with the other version. But like, uh, essentially... If I remember right, one of the key issues with them is they don't think humans evolved. So, like, uh, you're not going to have humans before Adam and Eve that were really had any sort of relationship with God or any sense of right and wrong. And uh, there's just a tremendous, like, level of, like, evidence that, like, even Neanderthals who had who were clearly not as rational and as intelligent as us, apparently buried their dead, which would be a clear indication that they had some sort of concept of, like, you know, morals and, and you know, they valued life and they, they had respect for people. Like, you know, it raises these questions. Um, that They have to be looked at. The Part of the problem is, like, what we're learning, you know, about the existence of these, like, pseudo-people that lived... You know, we found their bones all over the world. Um, we're constantly learning. Their, their, things are constantly changing in that world of human anthropology. We're like we're constantly learning new things that kind of upset the whole thingy. And there's been massive. There's like massive upsets and big changes all the time because it's just new evidence just keeps pouring in and, and keeps changing things. So it's very difficult to like say anything definitive right now. Um, so. Uh, apart from very simple things. So anyway, we're going to move on to the last view. This view is a very controversial. I don't know, I don't know if anyone really holds it, but it was, it's what called, what's called functional creation. Um, I think there's only like one guy who like defends it, but the reason I bring it up is because like there's one biblical scholar who defends it, but it seems like uh, Amazon really wants you to believe it because like, you know, I have a an Audible account where I get audiobooks, and like Amazon makes you pay for like all these. They they own Audible, and they make you pay for all these audiobooks. But if you want to get these these Bible books from this guy about functional creation, they give them to you for free. You get like all his books for free. <laughs> so I've like read all his books or listened to all his audiobooks, some of them more than once. And like his view is what's called functional creation so what what he what he envisions is like I, I have a house and I live in my house and so it's a house and at some point you know 50 years ago somebody built the house and so they created the house back when they built it but I live in it and it's a house it's a home if I if I started like you know I don't know selling food from my house then like he would say that I created a store, a food, you know, a snack store, because I changed the function of the house, but I didn't actually build anything. And so, under under, I think his name's John Walton, can't remember his name, but uh, under his view, like God, when God create, when it says in Genesis that God created something, he didn't really like. That doesn't mean that he literally created it, but rather that he he gave it a function. So what, or as he says, it's not material creation that Genesis is talking about, 
It's talking about functional creation where you assigned it a, a new job so that like, uh, you know, humans had existed for a long time, but they never had these jobs, you know, um, I think John Walton doesn't actually take a functional view of Adam and Eve. I think he he thinks that God created Adam and Eve specially. Um, but uh, So I think he actually takes a co-Adamite view. But I wanted to bring up the functional creation view because it's like... <laughs> it's so different. <laughs> so like, um, I, don't, I don't find it persuasive. The main problem is that he seems to think in terms of either a material creation or a functional creation. But what I, what I don't understand with him is that every material creation is also a functional creation. So it seems like he's giving a false choice or a false either or, when really you could have more than those two. <coughs> but anyway, uh, there we go. That, you know, I, that's, that's six views and uh, sort of the problems with uh, all of them that I see. Uh, so quick summary metaphorical view is just you don't it's unjustified or unwarranted by the text so I don't think you can it's I don't think it's any good the young earth creationism view problem the main problem with that on human origins is the incest problem theological creation a theological evolution the main problem with that is that you don't have a woman although there are other versions of theological evolution where you might would have a woman. Um, but that's the main problem with some of the versions I've heard. The co-atomite view, the problem is like, it's so, it needs to be analyzed more to see if there's a problem with it. <laughs> but to my knowledge at this point, I don't necessarily see one. Um... You know, even the problem that I, I, ra I raised when I was talking about it, I mean, it, it, what it says when it talks about original sin in Romans 5 is that God does not hold sin against people where there is no law. So that, like, God just held humans before Adam to account for what they knew. And, uh, you know, it says sin was in the world, you know, before the law, but against but against uh, God does not hold sin against someone's account when there is no law. So that like uh, these humans, you know, maybe they weren't moral yet, but once they were, you know, well then there's no difference between their situation and uh, it's it's no different from people that like you know die separated and never hear about Jesus. So it's not really a new problem. But anyway, that's really the main problem with co Adamite view. It seems like a good view, but like it needs to be analyzed more. <laughs> um, and then you got progressive creation. Uh, the main problem is it does seem like it it avoids the evidence on human evolution, and uh, so there's that. Let's see. And then you've got functional creation, which just seems like really trying to stretch the language. So anyway, there are six views and the problem with each of them. <laughs> and I guess the main takeaway from this is that uh, the correct interpretation of Genesis seems to, in every detail, seems to be unsolved. It is an unsolved problem for Christians and Bible interpreters. And that's okay um, which interpretation you prefer out of these six is not a matter of, like, faith. Um, what I mean is, uh, it's not some sort of doctrine that you, like, you need to, like, say, I have faith in so-and-so, so-and-so. Like, it's not a creed where, like, you know, you need to have faith in this. Like, it's okay to just say, we don't really know, and we're investigating this, and we're trying to understand this better and better, like, there, you know, because we don't really know what the Bible's saying about this. Um, people like to think that the Bible is, a, you know, would have to be very easy to understand, but I would challenge that idea and say, why should it be? What if the Bible is something that God wanted us to study rigorously and you know and put great 
great scholarship into. Why wouldn't God do that? What if the God is a book that's packed with like profound information that will only be revealed through careful study? You know, what if the Bible rewards careful study? While at the same time, there are some really important things in the Bible that are you know much easier to understand. So, uh, <coughs> there you go. That is the end of that. If you watch this video and you listen to me for over an hour, thank you for your time. Have a lovely, lovely day.